Zoom in a live audience and solve the math. It's just two clicks and it's done. Yeah. Well, it's working so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andrea, so just go ahead. Please. Okay, very good. Thanks. Um, all right, uh, can you all hear me? Right, should I adjust the cap down? Oh, good. Okay, if I, start, if I start being too loud, but let me know. But more importantly, if you can't hear me at the back, definitely let me know. Um, all right, so uh, GP asked me to give a lecture in this period. The, the title of this uh, FPM workshop um, is Magnetism in Quantum Materials to talk about magnetism. And I thought that um, frustration is a recurrent theme that I thought would be cool to tell you guys. This talk is going to have few equations, but it's going to be rich in concepts. Um, well, let's let's talk. Um, so whenever somebody gives talks on geometric frustrations, usually this is one of the first slides they show. And they point that, unlike on the square lattice, if you try to do the same on a triangular lattice, um, you end up with a problem. A more mathematically precise way to say it is that if you have an odd number of groups, then there is a competition between the exchange part, and that's what results in frustration. Um, so let's start slowly with Ising spin, so Ising. Uh, Ising was a German um, I used to say, yeah, I, I sometimes say easing, sometimes I say Ising. I guess somebody who's from Germany in the audience can correct me. Um, so the easing on a triangular lattice um, is a canonical example of the picture I just showed you. And it turns out that if you try to compute how many numbers um, of different states that the equinergetics are there, it scales uh, extensively with the size of the system. None of those configurations are happy, quote unquote, right? So, to quote Leon Tolstoy, all happy families are happy in the same way, but the unhappy ones, they're all unhappy in their unique way. And so, here there are many, many unique configurations. And in fact, if we try and do a simple calculation of how many there are, um, the naive count would give you roughly that one third of all spins is unhappy, which is you could have guessed from the previous picture. But now you have to take care of the triangles. Um, Overlapping and being next to one another. And so actually, the entropy that is uh, not satisfied, the number of states, is actually even greater. And that was first computed by Greg Barnier in the 1950s. Okay. So, this idea of the entropy, notice I here show entropy per side. Oops. Uh, the entropy per side is, is quoted over here, is what you would measure experimentally. But once you divide by R and normalize for unit size. Um, now, once you go to Heisman model and you try to do the exact same thing, you try to place on a triangular lattice, it turns out that actually you do have a unique state. And in fact, there is a theorem that was proven by Latin and Kisha, who showed that if you have a Brava lattice that is, and you know this, but with only basis of one atom per unit cell, then you're always guaranteed to have a unique solution. And what we need to do generally is that you have to essentially minimize the vector Q that gives you the best exchange energy. Okay. By the way, for throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about insulating vectors. Okay. So, this is a disclaimer. There is another sort of a very rich field of what happens in itinerance where the choice of vector Q may result not from geometric paths, as I'm explaining here, but because of the nesting of the Kirby surface. There could be competition with charge density wave and other electronic orders. So all of that, I'm going to happily dismiss. This talk is not about that, okay? Primarily because it would be impossible to fit it in one hour. Right? All right, so with this disclaimer in mind, let's stay with only insulating methods. And so the only thing you care about are this interactions J, I, J, O. And if you free or transform them in Q space, the minimum of that functional, well, maximum minimum depends whether it's parallel on the parallel interactions, gives you where, what value of Q you should have your work. Now, whenever you hear about frustrations, people talk about spin liquids. So what is a spin liquid? So let me first give you a definition of a, what you would call a classical spin liquid. Right? Um, the definition which is constructed is that you have to have this extensive degeneracy of the classical ground state. The non-constructive definition is, well, it's a system that doesn't order. Right? It's like you have bananas and then you have non-bananas. Um, so the non-binary definition, nevertheless, is useful because most of you here, I guess, are experimentalists. And so the, what you would do is you typically measure um, neutron scattering and see whether you see any drag peaks, magnetic drag peaks. Um, and that's a technique often used is neutron spin rotation that essentially measures 
a local magnetic field that is spelled by muons. And what you want to know is whether on different sides these fields are all correlated, was it all random? And that would tell you whether you have long range magnetic field or not. So let's say you know that this doesn't happen. Um, then you would ask what are the excitations in the system. If I start splitting the spins, what will happen? And in some situations, there are gaps, and some of them there are gaps, and you will see close of this in the soil. So here's one example. Let's take a square like this. Of course, if you only have near the same interactions, it's unfrustrated, but let's add the interactions along the diagonal. Okay. So this is the famous G1, G2 model. And you could ask, well, is this is familiar. Classically, the answer is yes. Because in fact, there is an infinite continuous degeneracy. If you want to change an angle between these two spins, providing G2 is sufficiently large, actually, the energy does not depend on the value on, on the angles. And you could see it this way, if you only look at the right spins, right? If G2 is dominant, what you've done is that you've created an AL order on the right sublattice. And you've also created an AL order on the group sublattice. Classically, if you compute the energy, let's say, of the right spin, due to the fact that it's surrounded by the group spins, you see that classically, the net spin or net magnetization in the bias sort of mean field approximation is zero. Right, because the red spin is surrounded by two blue spins that in this picture point downwards, and the other two blue spins that point upwards. Does it make sense to you? No. No? How okay. is it different from two pieces of two nail and the paramagnets put uh, together side by side? Correct. They are not, why, why, why would you call the spin lift? No, no, no. So, so I'll explain in a second. So classically, this is spin liquid in a sense that there is a degeneracy. In choosing the angle C. Right. If you can take two different paramagnets, uh, one kilometer apart, and there is degeneracy in them rotating with respect to each other. So right, sure. But remember, we want degeneracy that, that, have, that grows extensively with the system size. Right? So this That's is per unit size. Ah, okay. But you know, if you take two systems that don't interact with yes. Ah. So, so, so let me uh, the definition, I don't understand how it is constructed. Or, what inside this definition of spin liquid? Right. Well, you, you will see in a moment ago. But in this, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you were to displace the red spins a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, if you make the interactions along this horizontal point different from the right and to the left, which is what would happen if the center atom was not centered, right? You would not have the effect that I'm describing. So, one way to see how this Classical state, which has many, many equinergetic states being destroyed, is by quantum computations. Um, and essentially, what you do here, I won't go into details of what this means. If you're familiar with Hoxton chemical bosons, this is an example of how you could, in a so called large S approximation, write down your spin systems in terms of the new particles, which are bosons. You have to make sure that the Hilbert spaces match and there are proper accommodation relationships. And it turns out that you could do this. Um, the approximation often done is that you expand the square root. Of course, if you didn't expand anything, it's exact. But in practice, what you do, you expand the square root, assuming that this function, this number 2s, is much larger than the density of the bosons. So the density of the bosons essentially tells you about how far there are these deviations you see shown here. And what it explains is essentially what we call a classical spin wave approximation, or quasi classical. Quasi classical in the sense that it becomes exact. If you take each bar going to zero, or if you take the size of the spin x to infinity. Now, the practice, the practical way of solving this, notice that this you have what looks like uh, superconducting terms, except it's in bosons. So, this is what you would encounter if you had a superfluid. And in fact, this was Google who did this first. You could do Google rotation. And long story short, what you find in the end is this omega of k, which typically has. It typically looks somewhat like this. Okay? So if you have long range order, usually this is the spectrum you end up with. Um, and crucially, as you know, this is a bunch of this level of decoupled harmonic oscillators. Again, because we're using only quadratic terms in our Boson number. And you know that you have to compute the zero point energy, which would be in addition to this energy in naught that came classically. So the statement I made in the previous slide was that in R, the classical energy does not depend on the angle theta between the two spins on the two supplies. 
But if you try and do the same approximation or the same calculation here, but include the zero point energy, you will find that actually not all zetas are the same. And in fact, there are two of them zeta equals zero and zeta equals pi. But remember, the way I define zeta is this angle over here. So if you choose it to be zero, it looks like this. If you choose it to be pi, it looks like that. Um, people sometimes call this a columnar antiparamagnet. For the obvious reasons that in the picture on the top, you have columns going uh, horizontally, and here you have columns going vertically. And this was first done a long time ago in 1990 by Chandra, Coleman, and Larkin, who first did this quasi classical calculation. And this is an example of a phenomenon which is known, this was known prior to that, uh, famously posted forward by a French physicist, Milan, which is called order by disorder. It's the idea that usually fluctuations are bad for the body. So what Bilan was pointing out is that nevertheless, if you have fluctuations, in this case, the one that gives you the zero point energy, they can actually be helpful in selecting one of those infinitely many, or extensively many classical states and choosing just two discrete ones. Yes, question? Could you give some insight into what are these uh, bosons that you use, or are they just mathematical? Do they have like some physical? So, so the best physical picture I could give you is that of the spin waves. So what do bosons yeah. describe generally, right? So, so describe some sort of fluctuations. Um, describing them as a bunch of harmonic oscillators at different K points, that's more of a mathematical tool that's often used in quantum computing. But at the side, the qualitative picture is that you have your magnetic order. Let's pretend the angle theta was fixed. And what you do is that for a fixed level of theta, Let's say zeta was this angle. You say, well, what if I wiggle these things a little bit? So are they magnets or, or is it? Well, they're the spins. Spins bosons. No, the, the oh, bosons. Oh, okay. So what the density of bosons describes is the deviation from my original state, slightly to left or slightly to the right. So mathematically, what it does and is that essentially it measures the deviations of a z quantum number from the pin polarized along the local. And so, yeah, if, if that NV modulates in space, that means maybe here NV is zero and you're perfectly aligned. And maybe here it's off a little bit, and on the next side it's off by a different amount. And so you have this idea of an amplitude wave of the boson density. That is the spin density wave that I'm to Thank you. Feel free to interrupt me with questions, if that's very good. Um, so, may I continue here? Um, what Chandra Coleman Martin pointed out is that you could actually have this easy transition between these two columns states at finite temperature. This was later verified uh, by numerics using Monte Carlo studies. And it's actually relevant to, for instance, iron based superconductors, in which many people in the audience, GP, Jeff, um, Igor, many others have worked on. But this is going to be one slide, and this is only just to point out that. In a picture where you ignore the further surfaces, you don't ask questions about nesting. You think of moments as being localized. And it's not always true in the iron ignites, but in the iron chalcogenites. But what you find in, in, in some cases is that there is a regime of the order parameter that was suggested uh, by, by Super Sarchev and company um, shortly after these compounds were discovered that the order by disorder mechanism I just talked about, the one where you select one of the two orders, and this is your spin density wave. But prior to doing this, you could have disordered state that nevertheless has this easing order parameter that's been broken. Yes, sir. Just one small correction. Well, it was originally uh, suggested to be uh, implementation of all non rocket patterns uh, from disorder. Later, it will realize that there is uh, already on the mean field level strong by quadratic coupling. Um, Related to the thinner state, which Correct. does its job much better. Yes, it doesn't change yes. anything uh, on a conceptual level, but not from this order. Yeah. Yeah. That, yes, I agree absolutely. I have papers on that too. But yes, but the, for the point of the audience, I just wanted to point out that this G1, G2 square lattice I, I showed you earlier um, is not only a nice theoretical tool, but it, again, thinking of it as a particular approximation, it can apply to different systems, including iron child organized. All right, now can one avoid order by disorder? Well, first, 
Remember, the, the only example that's fun, I gave you a classical system a bit, was the Vanier calculation of a triangular lattice, but those were eyes in space, right? Um, so let me give you one example, which is well established in literature. And that's what people refer to as a classical spin -off. So this example of compounds that are on powerful lattice, and by the way, so Facebook 227, um, GP can tell you probably more than I can about this. Um, but what it has is a bunch of punishing the tree trip shown in this picture over here. And on each tetrahedron, you have moments that have strong easing and isotropy. That's because there is a strong spin of the coupling. The moments on chromium and dysprosium are huge. We're talking about spin S, which is as a 15 halves or seven. So it's a large spin. Um, and this large spin tends to point along the local 111 direction. But the direction 111 is not the global one, but it depends on which point of the line is so. So on each side of this tetrahedron, it's a it's separate local direction. Crucially, if you look overall, the system actually prefers to have overall ferromagnetic interactions. So this thing over here, even though it's kind of wants to point along its one-on-one -on -one direction, nevertheless wants to be as much as it can to be aligned with this thing over here. And so this allows us um, with the idea of so by the way, the way these interactions work is a combination of super exchange and dipole dipole interactions. It's not just nearest neighbors, dipole dipole, of course, goes like one over R cubed. Um, so there are theories of this of what the model Hamiltonian should look like. But sweeping this a little bit under the rug, let me tell you why it's called a spin -out. If you look at the water molecule, it turns out that what you so if you look at the particular oxygen atom, which is blue over here. On average, in a water molecule, it's surrounded by four hydrogens. And it turns out that the best way to optimize this is to have two of the hydrogen atoms that are closer to the central oxygen and two of them that are faster. Of course, you have to do it not just on one tetrahedron, but on all the tetrahedron. And the structure um, of the water ice could be mimicked to what I just showed you. If you assign an arrow, Pointing in if this hydrogen atom is closer to the central origin, like here, and pointing out if this if this hydrogen, the red atom, is farther away from the center. Right? So for now, this is just an analogy, a tool telling you that you could assign arrows in the fashion point. Long time ago, Linus Pauling back in 1935 pointed out that spin that forget about the spin. The water ice, the familiar ice we're used to, is a weird solid. Because if there were no crystallographical defects, if it was truly, purely um, um, pristine, right, which we know never happens, it would be a weird state that would have a residual entropy to do with the fact that you can never quite make this happen. And the reason is because, so if you look at how many configurations each of these hydrogens could be, Father in or father out, so that's two configurations. You have four such hydrogens, so total 16 is combinatorial. Out of the 16, only six satisfy the constraint that turns out two of them have to be closer and two of them have to be farther apart. Or the way it's in the language of the arrows is that two of them have to be pointed in and two of them have to be pointed out. And if you compute what this means, you know, this ratio of 6 16 enters in the total number of states. And if you take a log of that, you get a residual entropy, which becomes one half of log three halves per hydrogen. So this was famously tested in spin ice. And I believe this is the paper that actually coined the phrase spin ice um, by Archer Nuris. Um, there's a bunch of people, Bob Cover is a famous um, crystal, well, chemist crystal grow at Princeton. Um, Shiram Shastri is a theorist who is known, whose name you will see later in the talk as well. Um, so what they pointed out is that if you compute this specific heat in the computer, um, you subtract polynomials, you compute the entropy by integrating C over T, you find that the entropy recover is this dash line is actually not R of two, which is what you would expect if it was a full entropy per moment, but instead it's less. And the difference is precisely the residual entropy that line is pulling computed that remains sort of quenched unsatisfied. I'll let you ponder on this. Are there any questions? Yes. 
Um, now, you, if you're trying to do neutron scattering on this compound, the way this spin ice manifests itself, um, it turns out that there is a very cool analogy to glass electrodynamics. And what you could show is that if you compute the so called spin structure factor, it's the same as computing the correlator of the two uh, electric field configurations. And in Q space, upon uh, Fourier transforming, it has this particular pattern, which has become known as pinch points. So, this ball time type features that you see over here um, could be also people thought of them as pinch points because they're pinched in one direction but not the other, as you could see over here. And you could see that there's an intensity which is vertical, but there is no intensity in the direction. Um, and that comes out from the from the spin ice feature. So this has been touted as perhaps the best example of a Heisenberg culture. These are still easy moments um, of quantum of classical spin liquids. So you could ask the same question I asked earlier, well, do quantum fluctuations destroy this or not? So if I start with a quantum solid, I just, right? So can I somehow melt it and get a quantum spin? Right? So I just showed you a classical solid, and if you melt it, you end up with a classical spin, but how would you do it in a quantum way? And one of the best ways of doing it is to think of dimers, because essentially, if you look at only two local spins and then automatically couple, they would like to form in singlet. So if you ignore the triple configurations of yes, and only allow for, for dimers, that allows for the rich concept of what's known as balance bond solids. So the simple example in one dimension, if you take Hamiltonian, which is a chain, and it only has the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor interaction. It turns out that there is a special point in this ratio of the two coefficients in one half, where it turns out that the ground state becomes one of these two things. So there are exactly two not infinitely many, but two ground states, global ground states. And they essentially come from how you're going to cover the one dimensional line by dimers in an alternating fashion. Why alternating? Because any one spin can only participate in one dimer. And once it's occupied, that's it. The next one has to find a partner, either the one to the right or the one to the left. And there are two ways of doing it in lattice. You could try to do the same in 2D. So Sriram Shastri and Bill Sutherland were the first ones to propose this. And they show that if you start with a system like this, where you ignore the black lines that are kind of just to indicate that this is quite like If you imagine a compound that only has its bad interactions, you could see that all spins are equally happy because they are happy to form the dimers along the red bonds and be completely decoupled from one another otherwise. So that's an example of so-called product state. You just take a product state of dimers and each dimer is uncorrelated to some else. And in practice, once you add those black interactions, correlations do creep in, and that time space is much richer. One example of what this is realized experimentally is in strontium copper boring. So material shown over here. It's an insulating magnet that looks exactly well, you have to squint a little bit and distort the trajectory. But you could see that this orange bonds over here correspond to this pattern over here, and then show here the unit style just so you could see it uh, clearly. Okay. Um, Turns out if you take the strontium copper borate and you study the temperature and pressure phase diagram, it's actually very rich. You start with this diamond phase, but then from there, you have to get solids, eventually, you end up using more of a magnet. So you could see that there is interesting kinds of phenomena that are associated with these dimers. Okay, but the point of making the dimers that I pointed out is that we want to make a quantum solid. And so I just gave you an example of a quantum solid, quote unquote. And by solid, I mean the one where the dimers are arranged in a rigid fashion. So how would you melt this? Well, this idea goes back to T.W. Anderson's 1973 paper, where he suggested, well, the way you melt it, you just imagine that this bonds that I drew on the previous slides, they allow to resonate. And, and in a quantum sense, what you do is that you take a quantum superposition over a fixed covering of the lattice. In other words, what you imagine is that under the sun, each of these configurations, for instance, the one that looks like this, is a valence bond solid. But what you do is that you take all such configurations and then you sum them all over in quantum mechanical sense. That's your wave function. Okay, so this is a Gedanken experiment in the sense that W. Anderson did not write the Hamiltonian. Not quite true. He postulated that this might happen on a triangular lattice, just near the same one, a couple of triangular lattice. We know that actually it doesn't happen. In fact, the ground state by the 
example I showed you, uh, turns out to be 120 degree order of strictness. But nevertheless, the concept itself has stuck. And in order to explain why we call it the resonating balance bond, I give you an example that you'll probably know a lot, and that's the fancy of it. If you look at the old textbooks, um, they probably must be quite old. People would draw the double bonds and the single bonds instead of what we now know as a fancy ring. But the way, and then the words were said that actually what happens is that this localized pi bonds that form between the two PC orbitals, actually what they do is that they resonate between this state and this state, such that more accurately it should actually look something like this. Okay. Now, how exactly do they get to resonate in, in a quantum mechanical sense? I'm going to write down a quad Hamiltonian. So what you do is that you write down a state like this, which annihilates, so this is a bracket notation. You annihilate this state over here and you create this one over there. So with an amplitude probability density. And of course, you add the machine conjugate that would be as well. If you take this state, you annihilate this one and you create that one. Quantum mechanically, that's how you would achieve. Like if you wanted to write down the point Hamiltonian that does this, this is what you would do. And in fact, precisely that type of idea motivated this. Gibson, and I think his student, but also who was working with him, Roxer, at the time, this is going back in the 1980s, they were actually inspired by the Kuprecht, which is why they were studying this my life, but the Kuprecht motivation of understanding, what they pointed out is that what you want is that you could have this resonant terms coming with the T that I showed you earlier, but in addition, you could have a penalty in energy, or penalty, or maybe this V could be negative, in which case it's a gain in energy. Actually, making this more likely. And in fact, yes, if you make V negative, you end up with this state. If you make V very large, the state you actually want is the one where you end up with this staggered pattern of forms. But if you make V to be exactly equal to T, this realizes so-called rocks or kills in critical form. And that's the point where you, the system isn't happy between this state or this state or then what has. And in fact, it was shown by rocks or kills what you end up is a quantum spin. Why quantum not classical? Because we are no longer dealing with large spins. This is truly quantum calculations. We are talking about dimers, which are quantum mechanical objects, and we are looking at the quantum superposition of many states. Um, you could try to do the same on the triangular lattice. It's not the square as in previous signs are triangular. And there it turns out that there is actually, so first it was suggested by Mosa and Zodiac theoretically, and since then, you might show that indeed there is a parameter regime where the resonating valence bond of, of Anderson does indeed seem to exist. Now, notice that this is not just nearest neighbor spin model. We have to work hard and we have to make E to be roughly equal to E for this to happen. But the suggestion is that that state that can make happen. All right. Now you can say, okay, but fine, with experimentals, you want to work with real compounds that don't have dimers necessarily. You have to have spin one half or maybe spin one. Can you write for me a model at least, or maybe give me a compound that actually would be a quantum spin? So I'll give you one example, which theoretically is very promising. It's a Kagoma lattice. Many people who see this first, they think that it's a probably some French academician for all this. Turns out that it couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually a Japanese word for a particular kind of basket that has this pattern over here. And in fact, um, since I'm a theorist, I'll tell you about what happens if you try to put it in a computer. So using something called density metric normalization technique, I won't go into details of how it works. Um, I do it myself in my own group. Um, but there is a famous calculation that goes back to Steve White, the inventor of the method, um, about a decade ago, who showed that the belief at the time was that this is perhaps the best example of a quantum spin liquid that we have in a realistic spin half system. So a Kagoma model is very frustrating, as you can see from this picture. You could think of them as corner sharing triangles. And so each triangle over here has three neighbors, so three triangles that share some split. It should remind you of the spin eyes that I showed you earlier, except flat. Instead of corner sharing the tree drop, you have corner sharing triangles. Um, and so you say, well, yeah, so at least theoretically we have one good example. Except life is not so easy. You fast forward about six years since that paper, and it turns out there was a revision, namely that there was a suggestion, it's still unresolved to the best of my knowledge, 
um, that there is another state that seems to be very competitive, and people are torn and still there are debates as to what is the white spectrum calculation is better of this. In the end, it's that is ends up being the question of convergence, finite system sizes, the fact that you do this for technical reasons on the cylindrical geometry, and the cylinders are relatively small in size. Ideally, you want to go the cylindrical limit. So there's all kinds of theoretical dilemmas going on. The suggestions of this paper is that actually it's not the gaps in liquid that's widely in company sort of force, but in fact, it's so-called Dirac spillage. Again, I'll, I'll, I won't go in details of what these words mean, because it, uh, they will crop up later in, in this presentation. Okay, but let's turn the page. What about real materials? It's all fine. You talk about models, you talk about dimers, and perhaps spin systems and conglomerate. But how would I know if I have a quantum system? Again, the non constructive definition that used to be the, the dogma is that, well, you look like some sort of long range interactions and you hope that that's what it is. Of course, there are current examples that are spin balances where there is no order, where there is a very ragged landscape and the system just gets stuck in many minima that are chosen thoroughly. Um, there are examples where it's not spin liquid at all, but for instance, it's some quadrupolar ordering of spins. So I'll give you many examples where this first definition doesn't work. Um, I'll try to be a more precise definition, but as an experimentalist, what you typically want to do is that you want to look at the spectrum of citations. And if they're, particularly if they happen to be gapless, that is algebra, that means that you expect a power law in both specific heat and in thermal conductivity. Now, I remind you, there's an insulating compound. Okay, so we are not talking, there is no thermal liquid underneath, there are no carriers. In principle, you should see just pure bias one over t if this was a trivial paradigm in susceptibility. And this would have, so if you see some strange power laws in some dynamic quantities and organization, that's an indication that something can happen. But perhaps the best constructive definition that people agree on is that a quantum spin liquid or RVP is a state in which spins get fractionalized. So to explain to you what this means, I gave you this picture earlier of classical spin waves. This is what fractionalization looks like in one dimension. Imagine I created a defect. I started with under thermodynamic interactions, but I took this one spin in the center, and instead of pointing up, I put it, so instead of pointing down, I put it up. See that? Now look, it costs no energy to separate these two unhappy bonds and move one of them to the right and one of them to the left. Classically, the energy of this state is exactly the same as the one on the Moreover, you could move them arbitrarily far apart. Quantum first readers call it the phenomenon defect quantum. You have the board, you have defects. In one, you could think of them as kinks or phase slips, so they could be one dimensional topological defects. And you could separate them infinitely far from one another, and the energy doesn't care, which means you could think of them as individual particles that, that don't interact. But look what happened. I flipped a single spin. But I ended up with two particles that can travel independently of one another. These particles are known as spinons, and the prediction in one dimension is that you should actually have a continuum. Why continuum is because you have two particles, and so if you put a single spin, you could kinematically satisfy the energy and momentum conservation law in more than one way. Right? It's like um, I forgot what was the famous astronomy observation when they look for the spectrum of the sun and the the suggestion was that the beta dk must involve another particle, otherwise the energy and momentum conservation would fix the energy of outgoing electrons strictly, and that's how the neutrino was discovered. Right. But now let's take that picture, and it turns out that this goes back, this can be shown rigorously um, in analytical solution using so-called beta ions, and then experimentally, Bell Lake and, and collaborators um, showed some time ago, about yeah, 15 years ago, that actually you see this continuum um, in the quasi-dimensional materials that look like chains of atoms. I don't remember the compound, I apologize, I should have put it on. Um, but this is the best example of the spinners that we have. So from that perspective, if you have a one-dimensional chain of spin pump, you have this weird gapless excitation on the spinners, and that's the best example of quantum spin. The question, of course, can you go beyond one dimension? Okay, I showed the example of Godoma lattice. There's a famous material called Herbert Smithite, named after a mineralogist, long after the mineralogist passed away. Um, and it kind of looks like this. 
So essentially, you have somewhat distorted carbonyl because the blue atoms are copper, copper two plus. As Kiki would tell you, you probably know, there is spin half, just like in the corporate. And the spin halves live on the vertices of the carbonyl atoms. And if you do inelastic neutron scattering, what you see is the same continuum of excitations that was the smoking gun, quote unquote, on the previous slide, except now we're in two dimensions. Okay. So this may, um, well, and, well, so there are many examples, but the, the first person who worked on this extensively, I believe, was Yang Li from Stanford. Uh, this particular paper is taken from a paper by Colin Brockle and company uh, as well. And so for the longest time, this was believed to be our best chance at having a quantum spin liquid in quasi two dimensional layer materials. Um, except there was a problem. And the problem was, it turns out, and, and again, you guys know this better than I know in the series. It turns out that there is an unfortunate chemistry problem that the copper and zinc have very similar atomic radius. And in this compound, unfortunately, there is so called non magnetic side disorder. Because this purple zinc atoms that sit between the planes, 15% of them on average get replaced by copper. Now, why is that a problem? It's because copper, unlike zinc, carries a spin. So, Fazal just told you in the previous talk, if you, if you remember, the zinc has a fully filled shell, so it doesn't have a local moment. If you replace it with copper, you have an extra spin, you stick it in between the planes, and all these extra spins polarize the blue spins that sit above and below. And so this, this creates disorder because you don't do it on every hexagon, you do it you know, on average, one every seven or so. And this disorder ends up creating a bunch of moments and destroys your quantum spin. So this has played this uh, for a long time. There's a bunch of both theoretical and experimental data. For instance, shown here is a beautiful data collapse. This is a um, collaboration between the group of Harold McQueen and uh, experimentalists showing that you could take the specific heat data and measure it at different temperatures in the field. And the set collapse is, um, it turns out, to be mapped in a stereo disorder. Suggesting that all that beautiful physics that we thought was coming from quantum spin liquid is actually disordered. So, in fact, in the most recent paper that I found just last year, um, Yang Li, um, uh, Imai, and collaborators, they actually computed, uh, well, not computed, they extracted from the experiment what is the fraction of copper size that involved the spin singlet. So, we're not talking about chemistry disorder. I'm not asking how many coppers get replacing zinc. I'm saying, okay. Now that this happened, this chemistry problem has happened, how many of the bonds aren't the ideal bonds that, that form atoms? So, you know, the gonal atoms, ideally, you want all of them to fluctuate to form RDB. Unfortunately, the answer is only 60% of them do, but what did the other 40% do? Well, they get ordered. And that's why people no longer believe, and there's a bunch of theory and experiment papers that I cite here, that the barbell white and the um, so there are two materials. One is called barbell white, this one is just the Herbert Smith side. That neither of them, unfortunately, are good examples. Well, what about triangle lattice? I did mention triangle lattice to, to you earlier, and I showed this picture over here. Well, there has been a rich compilation. I mean, if you just start with the nearest neighbor um, triangular model, you would put yourself at the center, you would be smack in the middle of 120 degree order of things. Okay, I mentioned this just like the yellow and the paramagnet, but the same size. So you have to do something extra in order to get the regime, which looks promising. You need to crank up the certain quantum charms that you put in here. I won't go in details, this is from the paper by Sasha Chernyshev. Um, there was one particular example deuterium based material, which looks very promising. It's a layer compound. Um, it does look like it's a perfect undistorted triangular lattice. If you look at the, for instance, specific heat uh, and susceptibility, they show this strange power law. You can see from here. You see there is a power law um, over here. There is some abnormal plot law. And then if you measure in elastic neutron scattering, um, you find again a spectrum both in the energy and momentum space for each of these excitations. Um, unfortunately, you saw that again it becomes a problem. And in fact, it was shown that if you just take a, the same system and you disorder it, 
this is theoretical calculation showing that actually you could get a pattern that resembles very much what you see in the two scattering the uh, And so Sasha Chernyshev called this a quantum mimic where a disorder can mimic this had smoking gun. So in other words, it's not such a smoking gun if, you, if there is a way to take it. Um, there has been, I, you know, there, there are many materials. The search for quantum liquids has been going on for at least three decades. Uh, one of the famous examples are this organic salt. Okay, extra points for anybody who pronounce this word. <laughs> anybody? My knowledge of organic chemistry nomenclature ended in high school. Um, this is my best. This ethylene, diethyl, tetrathiol, fulvoline. Any chemists? <laughs> All right. So, needless to say, even chemists don't like it. So they say B, B, T, B, T, F. And then even that became a mouthful. And it says, you know what, let's just take letter E and letter T. And so in the model literature, people call it kappa E T salt. They don't want to pronounce copper and C and C, you know? It's a kappa E T salt, sometimes called bankrupt salt. Anyway, what are these organic things? Is that you have this long wall, looks like appendices. Um, and what they, you know, so but they are arranged in this three-dimensional pattern. But if you look at it from just the right angle, actually they form, this looks like square lattice, but the only links on the square lattice are the vertical one. So if you erase, like if you don't point this, you see that actually each side actually is coordinated six-fold. It actually is a triangular lattice. And again, there is a there is a rich physics going on where the effect of spin half it actually comes from two organic molecules being next to one another. Um, it's a theory of molecular orbitals. Essentially, you look at there is one on one electrons which um, is in, in the state um, of this molecular orbital, and that's the effect of spin. And again, there has been you know a long history um, with quantum criticality suggestions again that you have certain collapse. Um, and again, unfortunately, the disorder comes in. So, for instance, what happens often is that, again, purely chemically, you could have an anion valence. And what that would do is that it would basically obliterate one of the spins and create an orbital spin instead of perfect diamonds. What can also happen is that you could have a defect in this balance bond solid pattern, just like crystallographic disclination, or dislocation actually, that would create an orbital spin. So, with this, um, you know, I told you that in 2D it looks whole. Well, let me go back to this step, to the, to the classical spin arts, right? Because I told you that this was one example. Can we make it one? And the example I showed you of homium and dysprosium, remember the reason why we have spin arts rules was because of Ising and isotropy and strong thermodynamic effects. But it was later suggested that instead, if you look at systems that can influence equilibrium, those actually X, Y, blood. So instead of pointing on the z axis, they actually prefer to live in the direction which is perpendicular to it. Um, and moreover, it looks like they also want to arrange ferromagnetically. So perhaps this is an example of a quantum spin -off. because instead of using spins, now we're talking about xy spins, which are quantum objects. And crucially, we're no longer talking about spin, which is 15 halves, it's a spin one half. If you ignore the distant orbit and focus on the lower line double. Indeed, if you try and look at the experiment, you have to kind of squint and know what you're looking at. But essentially, in addition to this, uh, this uh, these are uh, nuclear graphics, right? So there's no end order. But you see this rod of the blue excitations, sorry, of these greenish excitations. Um, this is in particular cut in the base in, in the freedom zone. That's the example of the continuum. And it turns out that if you apply the magnetic field, it gets suppressed, just as would be expected from RDD. And so this seems to be very promising. Um, in fact, you could write down the theory of what this looks like. Essentially, if you look at a particular spin, it can interact with its neighbors by a ZZ interaction where this blue arrow will talk to this blue arrow. If that's all you have, this would be a classical spin -out. But now you have quantum charms, and there's a bunch of them. In fact, symmetry lab, there are, all you could write down is what's on the slide. And essentially, it's constrained by the D3D uh, local point symmetry. On the side of each tetrahedron. Now, let me say a few words about the famous phenomenon um, of what we call monopoles in quantum spin -ups. So, what I encourage you, so we'll go through this picture slowly, but imagine I start with a two in, two out spin configuration. I take that central spin, 
is in the picture over here instead of pointing one, one side. The suggestion that I'm about to put to you is that you could think that this arrow points from a negative to a positive charge, or maybe the other around positive to negative, as if it was a dipole moment. So this is a fake dipole moment, and in fact, it tells you that there's an active magnetic field associated with this. And the blue and the red spheres represent the monopole and anti-monopole. So why monopole and anti-monopole? It's because if you ignore the direct line, and you just count how many spins are there, you will find that three of them are pointing out and only one of them are pointing in. So if you if you imagine this was a local object, it would have a flux that goes through the sphere. So that's the thing you're not going for. Right? So again, I'm, I'm asking you to go on a bit of a Gedanke experiment, but, but imagine that you have not just positive and negative charges, uh, sorry, not, not just the north and the south pole of a magnet, but you could separate them. So the idea, which I'll show you on the next slide, is that if you could move these two guys apart, it's like you're taking the north and the south bar of a magnet and you're moving them apart. And now each of them is a magnetic monopole. The way this picture goes is that essentially the way you assign the arrows, is that or the way you count charges, is that you just count, you basically go back to polling idea. And whenever you see the arrow pointing out, um, you put the blue sphere, and when it points in, you put the, the red spheres, and you just count. You find that this has charge plus one, and that has charge minus one. If red means plus one, and blue means minus one. And hence, this picture of monopoles. And in fact, you could show that it costs essentially no energy in the linear approximation to separate this poles of the bar magnet. And what connects them is this invisible Dirac string that can fluctuate. Right? So that's how. Dirac mathematically showed the concept of a monopole. And so he showed that topologically for this to work, there has to be a point somewhere in the sphere where the vector potential is not well defined. That's where the Dirac string enters. And it has to, it cannot, you know, it has to either go to infinity or end on another monopole. And that's what happens in this picture. So this monopole and anti-monopole pairs can proliferate and they can move around lattice. And that's how you. The classical spin lines becomes a quantum spin lines. So why is it quantum object? It's because you have these strange dynamical objects that keep moving around. But locally, if they were not there, um, you still have the two in to out pattern that describes the quantum spin lines. Now, crucially, the argument is that if you now consider the smallest parts that a monopole and anti monopole can make, you create a pair of them. And then what you do is that you take one of them and you move around this parts and come back. The shortest path that you can make would involve the sixth trader, and it would involve actually maybe four, but it would involve basically six spins. So you would have to basically do the spin six times. And you could do it one way or you could do it the other way. And the idea of resonance is that you could do it that way or you could do it this way. And the true quantum state is a quantum superposition of the two. So this should remind you of the uh, of the benzene ring that I showed you earlier, and which means that you could write down a charm like this. I love this picture, by the way. So this is from uh, Paul Scharer Institute in Switzerland. This is not the computer animations. What they took, they took iron filings and they put them in water with the simplistic liquid to make sure. And so this is an actual photo, right? So it's not Photoshop, of filings floating on top of the water in the presence of heat. Right? That's not cute. Um, so this is an idea of pictorially what it looks like. The six fold rings were shown over here. And you could think of you know, the system rotating the left to the right, to the left and to the right. That's your quantum, uh, quantum spin rate. You could make it all precise. You could put it in the language of quantum field theory. And in fact, it looks like that of quantum electrodynamics. The one, well, allegedly the world we live in, except this is non relativistic, so we don't need to worry about those effects. And interestingly enough, um, we have magnetic monopoles, which is not something we have in our life. And so the idea is that actually you have the same kind of phenomena that you see in quantum electrodynamics, in particular, you have photons. Right? And so the prediction is that in addition to spin flips, which create a pair of monopole and anti-monopole at very low energies, you could also have a quantum light. A disclaimer, nobody has yet observed this, that's fine. Primarily because the energy scales involved are just very, very 
And unfortunately, this quantum spin I state that I'm describing for you is very fragile. It's surrounded by a regular magnet, paramagnet. You have to work hard in the parameter regime of the models to actually make it work. So does it actually work? One of the best examples of where, again, you will see this recurrent scene. Um, in fact, I'm almost done with the time, but you've seen this. That here's propose something, struggles go, find the material, and say, yeah, this is it. Okay, interview and pattern was the, this is it idea for the quantum spinners. Unfortunately, it turns out that it does happen in order, and you can see here the specific key, happens at about 250 milliseconds. So it does automatically, but about that transition, it has, it has this the, 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 the design physics. And so the idea is that, I mean, it just happens that unfortunately, it sits in the wrong part of the phase diagram, but what it actually is in a paramagnetic phase, rather than quantum spin. And so while this Etrugium material did not live, live up to its expectation, there's a new material. Um, I will not talk to you about this now because you can hear my talk on Friday or go into detail what it is, but there's a serial material, serial zircon. It turns out to have all the desired features. Again, maybe we're kidding ourselves, and it's going to be one of those stories that a decade from now people will say, nah, it orders mathematically at 10 million Kelvin, you guys just didn't measure it well enough. Or maybe they will find a disorder plays a role. For now, we don't know. And this is really the last slide of my talk. Um, what I try to convince you is that there is a rich physics attributed with the both classical and quantum spin. The classical ones are characterized by extensive degeneracy of the classical ground state manifold. It may be lifted by order by disorder, but if it is not, like in a classical spin ice, then you expect to have a residual entropy. Which you could measure by integrating the specific key. Moreover, it's interesting that morally, even if you, you know, in reality, we all live in a quantum world. So maybe at low enough temperatures, you may be lucky or unlucky to have a quantum spin liquid. But once you warm it up to finer temperatures, the thermal excitations would effectively make it look like a classical one. So in the end, even if the classical quantum spin liquids becomes unsuccessful, looking at them at finer temperature. Is still the reason for why classical spin is interesting. So, what about the quantum ones? I told you that they appear often as a result of resonation between the two classical spin configurations. In the case of spin half, you could think of them, this idea of RDB, as if you melt the valence bond solid by taking many, many equi energetic states and forming a quantum spin solution between them. Unfortunately, experimentally, chemical disorder on the magnetic and non magnetic sides often is detrimental to quantum super quantum spin liquid. And even theoretically, there is quite a lot of studies showing that it's very fragile. Right? Quantum on the car operation, on the car or DMRG, tensor networks all point to the fact that you have to work hard to even find theoretically points in the phase diagram for a quantum spin liquid. So the quest is ongoing. Um, I hope I have convinced you that this is sufficiently interesting. And okay, no, we don't need the extra slides. Um, and this is it. Thanks for attention. Okay, let's get some students first before we go to email. <laughs> so, what exactly are the experiments that we did that would be There are two statements there that, that, that have been called. So the disorder is either there or not, right? What experiment you choose to do is not going to fix the disorder. Right? It just may be that you may be kidding yourself by looking at a particular experiment and thinking it gives you the false signature, like the false positive, was in reality is the disorder taking playing tricks with you. So how so is your question that how do you avoid disorder or what do you measure? Those are two separate things. Yeah, so what would you measure? Uh, that would have a signature for disorder or a signature for the quantum liquid that you'd be able to discern. Understood. Okay. So, well, the first thing you would do, you would try to do essentially the decomposition analysis to, make, to look for the disorder, right? In addition to X ray, what's it called? The uh, XRD. Well, it would apart from X ray diffraction, if there is a particular, like if, you, if somebody has your compound and you want to know how many percent of copper is that, 
Yes. So, so you okay? So, so you want to know? You do some basic measurements, trying to, and often it takes years. It's not a process where you immediately know this. And you know, people trying to make their compounds better and better. For instance, um, Kanoda, a famous Japanese physicist, spent essentially his entire career on trying to affect those unpronounceable paragraph salts, the organic materials that form triangular like this. Right. So, so often it takes a, a, a concerted effort, you know, of, of several groups or one research group over many years to try and affect. Okay, now what would you measure to see whether it's disorder or not? Often people would like to see whether there's a sign of skin breathing. So spin glass or structural glass, right? Is something which there is an idea of the cascade of the of the time scales. And so often the idea is that if you want to distinguish them, you typically want to look for zero field cold and non-zero field cold samples, see if there is any difference. Ideally, if you actually want to prove that it's spin glass, not to confuse with spin ice. So spin glass is, is a classical, not a quantum defect. There is nothing resonating there. You just happen to be stuck in many local minima and you sample them thoroughly. If that's what it is, then as you imagine doing an experiment on different time scales, you would see different behavior because you would see that these fluctuations, some fluctuations would switch. So if you do something like the most power, it happens at very long time scales, small frequencies, you would see one of them. So ideally, people look for AC type measures. So AC susceptibility in I don't know, megahertz, gigahertz. I'm not sure what the range of frequencies you want to see. Um, but yes, so often it's 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 one of those things where you try to look for things that are not how should I say you, it's a it's a matter of master of exclusion. You do the experiment and you hope. Hope for your best that this is not what you see. Okay, you do MSR and there is no order, and you you breathe a sigh of relief. You do neutron scattering, you don't see breakfast. Then somebody says, "Ha, ah, it's a spin glass," and you just prove it. And you do painstaking measurements of its susceptibility, and ah, it's not. Okay, maybe I'm one step close. Well, I don't have serious, I mean, but yes. Can I ask you a basic question? Is there a threshold of disorder? You know, I mean, how many defects does it take to ruin the skin? Yes, so there has been precisely that question has been asked by the theorists. Uh, essentially, what you do is a bunch, I mean, it's a brute force max. It, it's hard. Um, you typically do classical Monte Carlo with some random distribution of defects. You average on many, many realizations of disorder. And you look at some signatures and see, well, does it still look like a quantum spin liquid if you were to compute spin spin correlations? Okay, what can I tell you in practice? 15% was the magic number that turns out destroys the quantum spin liquids and perverts the time. There was a hope that with zinc borlovite, it's a related compound, just uh, I think you have some chlorine there and some, uh, some other. Okay, I can't remember the mechanical formula, it wasn't one of my slides. In zinc borlovite, that number turns out to be 5%. So young we and others were hopeful that look, we decreased disorder from 15 to 5. Maybe that is it, right? Maybe that is enough. If you talk to my um, colleague Pan Ching Dai as well as Bruce Golden, they would put their bets on the stereo material because the disorder is believed to be within single percent uh, values. Below, I think three percent is, is what they say. So they're confident that the stereo, you know, there is no intersubsidized substitution. So these are experimental numbers, 15%, 5%, 1%. But theoretically, it's not it's clear. Not simple, yeah. One percent is still a huge number. Right? I mean, when you know, compared to silicon, yes, <laughs> one part of it is zillions. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the short answer we don't know. And by we, I mean there are recent papers as recent as last year yeah. that is still debating, and, and it's essentially it's an ungrateful task. Trying to put the bottom of this. Okay, um, Florian, and then you, and then you. Work. Right. So I always read to measure the spurt for quantum liquids, just like you described. And I think it's like a candidate material that look for order to show that it's not quantum. What I have never understood is why. Why does the quantum liquid always has to be the lowest temperature state? Why can't there be an intermediate quantum? Temperature? Quantum liquid, and then that comes another phase. Now, why does it always have to be a low phase? Like, 
Okay, well, so yes, if you're agnostic, you would say, look, I only measured down to 200 milli Kelvin. What is that to prevent another state from intervening at any lower temperature? But that's what you're asking. in a bad way, you know, why can't I just do one? Like, I can be an anti from from uh, Cooper, right? From 100 yes. to whatever, and then for Cooper conductor, why can't I just be a part of the oh, liquid? Okay, now I'll hear your question. Yes, okay. So, so there is a good reason to believe that essentially what 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 doesn't help you is mirror store laws or that act. Ideally, you do not want to have a zero entropy. You want to get rid of it. And so, so, so the insulating system of spins tend to order by a long range order. That's the best you know, form practice, well defined order. It's a unique state, you know, that. Okay, with some fluctuations. In order to even theoretically stabilize a quantum experiment, you have to work way harder. You have to make it very, very hard for the system to find that system. Which is why if people study G1, G2, G3 type models, small parameter regime when G2 and ratio of G2, G1, and G3 is very fine tuned. And then you hope that, aha, that's my quantum story. So, unlike superconductor, where you hold the book, as long as material is metallic, maybe, just maybe, any material in the end is going to be a superconductor. Okay, that, that's a reasonable belief. Just the Ginsburg criterion, maybe that you will see the 10 to the minus 15 Kelvin, but who cares? Conceptually, it's possible. The quantum spin liquid is yes, we out. Once something hijacks you and puts you in one kind of state, you're done. You can't get out of it. Okay? So, so that's I think is the main difference. It's in, intrinsically not a stable state of matter. It likes being destroyed. And not just by by disorder and, and experimental related to by the proximity of other order phases in time. So, rephrase your question. What, why can't you have a quantum spin liquid at 10 millikelvin and then at a lower temperature go into a ground state of gas? Oh, no, that's just saying it has to be the ground state to call it a quantum spin. Correct. Strictly speaking, that's the definition. Now, of course, operationally, you can never get that. So, so that's why technically you could argue that everything you see here is a finite temperature measure. So you may be unlucky, you're just measuring a classical spin liquid background that stems from fluctuations in our sub order state. And it could be that they that will never know. But the consequence of the quantum spin, such as a magnetic monopole, mm -hmm. could you, you know, let's say there is a one millipel monitor quantum spin is, could you, in principle, still have the monopole? Right, and, and that's that's the best defense that, that people in the frustrated spin community would tell. They would say, look, even if we are so unlucky that in the end if one million really Kelvin becomes thermal again, look at the which physics we discovered. Quantum electromagnetism, we have monopoles moving around in the lattice. Yeah, it happens at 100 million Kelvin above that paramagnetic state that hijacked you in the end, but who cares? The physics is still interesting. Right? And, and so I think that's that's the that's the theme that I'm trying to, to suggest to you. Um, is to give a little bit of, you know, um, yeah, humor, humor us a little bit. The theorists would say, ah, there's a quantum spin liquid that's exciting because it is exciting intellectually, even if it may be that it's very hard to achieve experimentally and prove, yeah, it's always going to be a quantum spin liquid. Okay, uh, next question here, and then we can go on. But we should wrap up. So I was wondering, you were talking about order. I guess what comes to the order? Okay, so, so let's start with an order state. You heat it up. The disorder, not disorder, yeah, the, the, the fluctuations are often determined, right? That's the way you map a regular list in the L state. Okay, so I understand your question. It will always go up in temperature, and that usually you know, doesn't create any order. So the order disorder, but the, the, even the phrase itself, order by disorder, it actually appeared in the title of the last paper, was put there like a tongue in cheek statement. Like, look, it sounds stupid, and I'm writing it because it sounds stupid, but nevertheless, consider it, please. Right? So, so that's that's a counterintuitive statement where you go to low temperatures, and fluctuations, typically quantum, starts to become stronger and stronger at low temperature. But instead of making it worse, they actually help to stabilize a particular state. And that's the idea of the, of the order by result. So, at what temperature does it happen? It's hard to say. It depends on the energy scales involved in the problem. 
usually from, you know, well, yeah, it's, I can't make that mistake in this case. Well, so look at the example of the RNA tags. Um, not RNA tags, I just give it as an example. This G1, G2 model. The idea of this order with disorder actually happens above the melting temperature of the NAR state. So some sense, what happens is that it's an easy degree of freedom, which is discrete. Norman Wagner theorem does not, you know, does not prevent it from ordering. And so you can actually have that order by disorder happen at a temperature which is, let's say, 300 Kelvin, 350. And then the neon temperature will happen even lower. Right? So, so there are examples where it might be possible, but as Igor said, it's actually normal to take there are Fermions involved are like the spin spin interactions, it's it's messy. I I have two real questions, not almost not real questions. And one of them is continuation of Florence question. I heard these similar questions asked before, and people saying, well, you have to distinguish between uh, quantum spin liquid and quantum parameter. And I could never get a simple explanation of what is this difference between. Uh, and let me just ask the second question you asked, answer both of them. Second is more specific. I remember, uh, I have a recollection, which might be a wrong recollection, uh, that the theorem of quantum spin liquid, or actually spin liquid at all, on um, lattice only applies to Heisenberg Hamiltonian, not to XY. Is that correct? And if it is, uh, then how robust is that? Um, okay, let me try to tackle the second question last uh, first. I am out of my depth here, um, meaning there are people way better qualified than me to answer, perhaps. So, indeed, on a Kagoma lattice, there is a subtle difference between what happens in Heisman versus XY case, the so called weather vane modes. And so, essentially, yeah, so there is a difference, but I do not recall. I, I never worked on it myself, so I. I'm sorry, I can't tell you more. Um, but I can I can point you to the people who can. So um I think it was some I mean, model on Kagome on to Heisenberg or Triangle or something. Yeah, no, no, yes. So okay, so so the people who for sure know, like I can, if you could call it now on Zoom, they would help. Roderick Mosner is one, he worked on it a lot. Um, the other person is gosh, um serious side the name space. Um well, never mind. This okay, anyway, I'll, yeah, it'll come back to me. But yes, so there's no the very first question quantum parameter versus yes. yes, okay. So, um, often the statement is false that if you have spin half systems, um, the so called Lip Schultz Matisse or Chicago Hastings theorem tells you uh, five names in a row. It, it's a theorem that tells you that for spin halves, it's impossible to have a ridiculous quantum spin liquid without one of the two things happening. A, you have a gapless spin liquid that is allowed by Dirac spin. Or B, if it's gap, it has to be deployed. And so then people say, aha, uh -huh, that, that is, should be distinguished from a quantum parametric, which is some ridiculous state that could be smoothly distorted into a, a product state. Okay. So, so the distinction is often like, well, if you could show me the logical order parameter, some you know, non-trivial Boson loops, that would prove that it's not just a quantum parameter, it's an actual order hidden quantum spin liquid. Which is why I didn't have time here to mention this, but the whole idea of quantum the time spin liquids, alpha and trichloride in recent years, is precisely clinches around that, that statement. That, that if you could show that the state is a quantum spin liquid, and there are some indications theoretical or otherwise that's logical. Then you know for a fact that it's not sort of your trivial state with a lot of fluctuations. It has intrinsic logical form. So that's often the distinction. So, so the, the corollary is that it's not enough to show that there is no order. You also have to show that there are some topological variants or something, which might be much, much harder. Than that. Correct. 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 Which is why, which is why, as I stated, it's a bit of this, you know, banana not banana problem. Is that yes, ideally we want the definitions to be as complete as possible. Often people would be satisfied if you show them spin rationalization. 
because that usually comes with topological orders and there are strings and so forth that which is multiples and multiples. So if you see signs of rationalizations, which again are indirect, and you don't see multiples in the situation, but I will talk about this in detail tomorrow and try to convince you that actually that. Okay, any quick 30 second questions? The question so how does a wild geo use uh, that a string request rather than a string classic? I mean, classic, since they are a result, they are both a result to the galaxy of the one state. Right. So, so, to get glass in this, we need to solve. So, the definition of the glass state is if you look at the energy landscape, it has to be rugged and non uniform. You have to have a lot of very sharp minima. Where things can get stuck. The spin, uh, oh, sorry, the, the spin liquid is almost the opposite of that. You want to have a very flat, homogeneous manifold. And if this was classical, this would be a classical spin. Then you add quantum fluctuations and you hope, fingers crossed, that it doesn't just go order by disorder and chooses one state, but instead it chooses this resonant state that combines many, many of such states. But the whole point is that they need to be able to interject. If they're not, you have your spin balls. Now, if your question is more experimental, like how does a given material know whether it wants to be a spin glass or spin liquid, I think it's similar to the question JP asks. It's about how many percent of the soda you got. Right? Because in the end, the soda can always quench uh, and we use glass in the same spaces. Okay, you better wrap up. So thank you very much. Thank you.